So from the age of about 14 until I was 18, I desperately wanted to have fame and fortune. And like everybody else, I guess that's what I chased. That was the most important thing. The strange thing is, though, everyone chases that, but no one seems to learn that uh, neither fame nor fortune necessarily equals success. Success, as I look back on it now, is really uh, belongs to the man or woman who is happy where he or she is. Up to the age of 11, I was quite bright, you know. I, I, my, in my school, I was uh, the number one boy in the school. Uh, but there was a, we used to have an examination called the 11 plus and at 11 years old every child in Britain used to take this special examination and then you went either to a, a big school or a little school and I failed and went to this little school and it upset my educational process and my, my the psychology of it well I was damaged I think in some way so from then onwards it was always a struggle to learn and especially after I had the ambition to be a rock and roll singer because then I couldn't see the value of learning French, for instance, if I wanted to be a rock and roll singer. Why would I need French? Of course, now I wish I'd learned French because uh, it wouldn't have changed my ambitions and it wouldn't have stopped me being a rock and roll singer. And it would have given me a chance to uh, sing and, and, and communicate with one of the largest audiences in the world. Right. Do you want, would you call it out to me very slowly? Tu as vu? Tu a... After I'd been successful as a rock and roll singer for about two years, I, you know, like every thinking person, you start to think, well, you know, what is this? I mean, is rock and roll the answer to life? And the more I thought of it, the more I thought, no, it's not the answer to life. And then I thought, well, what is? There must be something in life that's, that's more important than rock and roll. Of course, I realize now what it was, but it took me about two or three years to ask many questions and I obviously my my background as a, a person who had come through England and therefore I was not an atheist as such I just didn't care about God too much I then looked back into the things I'd been taught as a child and I remember reading about the Jewish people and so I went to Jewish people and spoke with them but for me uh, as much as I find found a lot to admire uh, I didn't find any any complete answers I then spoke with Jehovah's Witnesses and over a period of about a year or maybe two years, uh, they interested me greatly because they read the Bible regularly. And although I didn't gain much more than that from them, it was enough because that made me read my Bible. And when I read my Bible, I recognized that what the Bible says is that Jesus is the only way to God. If we want to find our way to God, there is only one way. And it's really the secret of all our successes, I think. If we have the key to something and we use the key to open the door, you're immediately successful. So I believe that the moment I used my knowledge of Jesus and made it something personal by committing myself to him, it opened the door to life for me. I went the same route as everyone goes. You know, when you're, when you're 15, 16, you think you know everything. You think your parents know nothing. You, you think that now I'm 15, I'm learning, I know everything. It's rubbish. I know now. It's easy for me to say now. So if you're 15 now, uh, you may think that you know everything, but believe me, in five years' time, you'll realize how little you knew. So I had to, I had, it's, a, it's a big lesson to learn. But when I became 24, I suddenly realized how little I knew about life. And the one thing that's for certain is that my confidence grew as I, as I became a Christian. Um, my attitude changed as I became a Christian because suddenly it was not important to be right all the time. You know, me, Cliff, I have to be, I'm the winner, I, I'm the number one, you know. That became less important. Yes, it's, it's important that my job, that, that, that what I do in life is the best that I can do. I, I put all I have into my career and I do the best. Sometimes I'm successful and sometimes I'm not, but I try my best. But Jesus changes your attitude to yourself and, and, and more importantly, it changes your attitude to other people. So I found slowly I was becoming more involved in, in organizations like Tear Fund, which, which works in third world countries. Um, and so major changes, I think. You can't become a Christian and have, have nothing change. It, it must change. Jesus is love, says the Bible. He loves us. How you combine it with this world fully in need. So much uh, cruel things going on. Well, you see, what you have to do is bring God into it. We are in the world. 
And the only world we, the only way that we can affect the world is if we blow the spark where we are and make it fan into a flame. So that each one of us must represent God in the world. It's too easy for God to come down here, you know, and say, oh, poverty. <coughs> no poverty. Then there is no success for you and me. We had nothing to do with it. And also, if he did that, within 20 years, some of those people would be poor again, and some would be very rich, because that's human nature. I think it would be completely wrong of God to tamper with human nature. He's already made us perfect, perfect because we have a choice. And if we choose to burn 20,000 tons of corn, then we have chosen to do something bad, because we could give it to, to starving people. But we choose to do the bad many, many times. So all we have to do as Christians is to say, there is good in the world, let's make that good happen in our lives and therefore start to affect other people's lives and then people will see the effect of God working through us to change the world. But the world is a very angry place and it's a very stupid place because we don't recognize the power that God has given every single one of us, the power for doing good. If only we'd recognize that power. What would you say to young Christians? I would say what you have to do is be sure that you understand more of God with every day. There's only one way to do that. Uh, well, there's, there's, I suppose there's a couple of ways really. But basically, if we read God's Word every day, we don't have to read a whole chapter or a whole book every day. We only have to decide, okay, supposing we say I'm going to read 10 verses every day of the Bible. It's enough, you know. Because in every 10 verses, there is so much information, we'll never take it all into ourselves anyway. So as long as we read something every day, then I think God's messages come through. And the more we understand God, the more we will grow in confidence and strength, and, and, and we're able to face the world. You see, I mean, I face the world now as a Christian, not because there's anything special about me. What? There's nothing special about me. Except that I sing maybe, uh, I make a noise that someone else doesn't make. But that other person may make another noise that is just as important. So uh, I only know that I can face the world with confidence because I know that God is alive. I know that Jesus is part of my life and that I can be valuable to him if I permit him. And so I would say to young people, let yourself grow in, in your knowledge and understanding of God and let him use you. Okay, ready? Go. Tea is ready, Clev. I'll be right down. Good news. Good news. Good news. Heard from heaven in that good news. You're a rock singer, and you combine it also with a gospel singer and being a Christian. Sometimes you, I think you have to cope with that. How do you do that? The only problem is uh, being a Christian. It's tough for everybody. I suppose it's easier for me because I think the hardest place to be a Christian is at school or university or college, uh, where young people, other young people, think that they already know everything about God. You know, at 15, you know about God. So anybody else, your friends, if they are believers in God, you make fun of them and you're, it can be a very aggressive place. Whereas for me, I don't care if there's a 15-year-old or a 50-year-old uh, looking at this show and saying, Cliff Richard is crazy. I say, I don't care if you think I'm crazy. I only know that Jesus is right. And so there is a strength in being older. So for me, perhaps it's not as difficult as some. But it's very important to be the Christian, and that's the tough part. It's always going to be tough to be the Christian. So for me, I suppose, because I have to appear on television, I have to present myself. Not everybody speaks like this. Most people keep things secret. Uh, but I feel it's important that my, my faith is never secret. So my problem is having to deal with the media. I have to speak about my faith when I can on television. I, when I speak about my faith with the press, sometimes they twist the words, and it's very difficult to receive the truth from a newspaper today. So those are my kind of problems. And of course, every time I go anywhere, because I am a, a known rock and roll singer, everyone expects me to behave in a certain manner. So there are problems that I have to face that, that others don't. But no matter where you are, if you're a Christian, it's not going to be easy. How far can a man go in, into a rock career and be a Christian or a gospel singer? How can you go anywhere? There isn't a single place. You know, um, there's not a single thing in this earth 
that does not belong to God. All of it was created by him. But the story also says that there is a devil, a Satan, and he has taken as much as he can and is trying to destroy what God made. And we can give it to him if we want. If we want to give rock and roll to the devil, he'll take it. He already took a lot of it. I just try to take some of it back because it doesn't belong to the devil. The devil didn't create anything except chaos. And so therefore there is nothing in this world that, um, that is really bad, but it can become bad if we allow Satan to use rock and roll or to use the media, to use films, to use television, to use newspapers. And so I would say that all of us must be very aware that we, again, coming back to a very early question, we must be God's representation in whatever job we do. And so therefore, if we're going to represent God, then we have to just do the best we can. So I will go as far as I can into rock and roll, carrying my banner of Jesus. And that's all that matters, because when he wants me to stop, he'll take away all the power that I have within rock and roll. And when I feel that power go, then I'll realize that God is saying, no, Cliff, that's enough now. I don't want you to go any further. I have plans for someone else to do it. And as long as I'm prepared to hear his voice, and sometimes it's hard to hear that voice because he doesn't speak with the voice. Not to me, he doesn't. It's usually through some situation that occurs or something I read in the Bible or something someone says to me that I think, hey, wait a minute, that's a, that, I think that's meant for me. So uh, we just have to be representatives where, wherever we are. If we take note of all the extreme views there are on this world, then it seems to me that this world is doomed, absolutely doomed to fail and doomed to death. I refuse to listen to all the extremists. I only know that each one of us has a responsibility to our fellow man and therefore to our environment. So I'm not an extremist, but I believe we must take care of how we live so that we don't damage uh, the environment for the next generation. But I'm not extreme on that. In the same way as I don't have an extreme diet. Even my extreme faith doesn't say, you have to be a Christian. I say, I want you to be a Christian. But if you don't want to be one, it's your choice. So I'm never extreme in anything. And I would prefer to believe an extreme God. I, I believe in God more than I believe in extreme man. And so therefore God tells me that this earth we will not have the power to damage this earth. Only God has had the power. He did it once with a massive great flood. And he vowed he would never do it again. And the only thing that will ever happen now to this earth is that one day Jesus will come back and there will be all hell to pay. But that's not in our hands. So I firmly am very optimistic. I think it's good that we are concerned about the world and we are concerned to be in the middle, not extreme, to care about animals and babies and the environment, but not so extreme that we are blinded to God. I wish I could force people to see and understand Jesus, but I can't do it. So if what we have spoken today about has any value at all, and it has helped one person to understand Jesus a little more, then part of my wish would already be uh, granted. But I would wish everyone to have a fabulous life. But uh, as I say, I can see only one way in which you can have a really good life, and that's with God and with Jesus.